Yeah. Right. So you're ready? Yeah. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, as you see, we, we changed our program and start uh, this morning with Hans uh, Nguyen, I hope more or less correct, University of Nottingham. He will speak about homological methods in random non commutative geometry. So please go. All right, thanks a lot. So yeah, I would like to thank the organizers for letting me speak here today. So this is a joint work together with James Gaunt, who was actually the one who was supposed to speak here today, and with uh, Alex Schenkel. So yeah, uh, by the way, can you see the mouse cursor? Perfect. Okay, good. All right. So yeah, then we'll start. So, so first, let me give you a brief outline of uh, this talk. So I, like half of the speakers already did, I will give some kind of a background around these fuzzy spectral triples. So yeah, I will try to keep it shorter because you've already seen it a few times already. But so I will give some background and then I will just briefly say what they are and uh, yeah, say some something about this, why they are good for studying random non commutative geometry and the, the path integral. Then I will move on to what we have done, which is sort of implement the BV formalism to see how one can consider path integrals, which also comes with gauge symmetries. So this is sort of the main part, I would say. And yeah, I will end by trying to summarize everything. All right, so let me first give you some background. So as we probably know, real spectral triples correspond to non-commutative Riemannian spin geometry. And uh, why this is interesting for physicists is that Riemannian geometry we know is related to gravity. So gravity is basically just described by Riemannian geometry. So therefore it's not far off to think of <clears throat> these uh, uh, real spectral triples, which are non-commutative versions of Riemannian spin geometry to describe some kind of something in quantum gravity. And uh, the idea is to sort of take this non-commutative space, <clears throat> uh, non-commutative, uh, sorry, these real spectral triples as some kind of non-commutative space time. And uh, one of the crucial pieces which we're interested in is the Dirac operator, which shows up. And uh, yeah, as we recall, the geometrical or metrical data is encoded in this Dirac operator of a spectral triple. So in the case of commutative uh, spectral triples, we can actually reobtain the geodesic distance through the con distance formula. So yeah, so what we say is that path integrals over the space of geometries should be something like integration over the space of Dirac operators. So we want to consider a special type of spectral triples or real spectral triples, which are so-called fuzzy spectral triples. So uh, if we just first consider a Clifford mod module V, which is complex numbers, K copies of the complex numbers together with a Clifford module action of this uh, Clifford algebra CLPQ, then uh, a fuzzy spectral triple, as uh, yeah, mentioned in the article by John Barrett, is a finite dimensional version of a spectral triple, real spectral triple, where we take the algebra functions to be <clears throat> matrices and the Hilbert space of spinners to be these matrices times this Clifford module. And the left action is simply given by 
I mean, the left A action is given by multiplying with these matrices from the left. So it is a left module, left A module. And then we also have these uh, chirality operators and the real structure, which I will not talk much about in this uh, talk. And these should, of course, satisfy some properties. And in particular, uh, we also obtain a right module structure on this uh, Hilbert space through this real structure, which then in this case takes the form of right multiplication by uh, a matrix on the first slot. So as we see now, we haven't mentioned the Dirac operator yet, D here, but so these things, this data here, which I just presented is also called a PQ fermion space. So this we will leave fixed and we will let sort of the Dirac operators to vary. So, so these are sort of the interesting parts for us. So the thing is that for fuzzy spectral triples- so Hans, shouldn't right multiplication yes. have a star in there? Okay, uh, that should be J A J star is right oh, yes. multiplication. Yeah, okay. Yes, uh, yeah, that's a typo. Yeah, thanks. All right, so uh, yes. So for fast spectral triples, it's nice because we know what the Dirac operators look like. So they have they are fully classified and there's some explicit formula for them. So they're basically given by this kind of a sum. So we have a commutators with uh, an anti hemorrhagian matrix inside <clears throat> and uh, another term with anti commutators with permission matrices inside. And uh, these alphas and taus are just some products of gamma matrices. So this is the rough form of a Dirac operator. And uh, yeah. Like I'd mentioned before, you can recover the geodesic distance from Dirac operators on these Riemannian spin manifolds. So uh, this, yeah, so this gives us a way of thinking of Dirac operators as a space of geometries on some fixed PQ Fermi space. And uh, yeah, the terminology used is Dirac ensemble. And yeah it takes the form of a real finite dimensional vector space. Right, so just a quick, easy example. So one of the simplest examples. So just <clears throat> the algebra is just the matrices again. And now we take the Clifford module to just be the complex numbers. So then the chirality operator is just doing nothing. And the real structure is permission conjugates on the first piece and a complex conjugate on the other. And the Dirac operator just takes this very simple form, which is just a commutator with some anti hermitian matrix. So this example is quite singular. So maybe we want something closer to geometry. So one of the main examples which has been studied a lot is the fuzzy sphere. So one way of describing is that, okay, so first we consider an irreducible spin and half representation, which I will denote by W. And then we have this action row. So <clears throat> this row from SU2 to then the morphisms of this W. So the fuzzy sphere algebra, we will just take to be this and the morphisms. So it's just the matrices N plus one times n plus one matrices. But so then one can ask the question, how is this, how does this describe a sphere? Well, so if we look at a basis of SU2, so which I will denote by EI, and then these guys satisfy this usual SU2 commutation relation, then we can look at, use this map rho to map them into the matrix algebra and uh, yeah, these, uh, the image of these bases will generate the entire algebra and they will satisfy these following relations. And in particular, this 
x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared equals to the identity matrix. This is just the unisphere relation. Yeah, and this lambda here is just some normalization to make this into the unisphere. And then the Hilbert space is like this. And the Dirac operator takes this following form where these Lij's are commutators of these Xi and Xj's. So yeah, if you want more details, I'll just refer to the article by John Barrett. So uh, this takes us to the random non commutative geometry and the path integral. So, right. So we will now fix a fermion space. So we fix a matrix algebra, we fix N, and then we have a, a Clifford, sorry, a Hilbert space and the, this uh, chirality operator and the real structure. So the crucial part here is that uh, this uh, space of Dirac operators is finite dimensional. So as we said before, these are interpreted as the space of geometries. And yeah, it's called the Dirac ensemble. So the crucial part is that it's finite dimensional, which means that the partition function or the path integral is uh, well-defined. So yeah, the partition function is just as usual given by this integral over this e to the minus the action s of d. So in this talk, we will just consider polynomial actions. So actions with polynomial in the Dirac operator. And then the expectation values are computed as follows, just by inserting this observables inside the integral like this. So it makes sense to just mention some previous works by some people. And I think most of these names are actually attending this uh, conference. So uh, yeah, on the numerical side, we have John Barrett, El Glaser, and the uh, John students, uh, Mauro D'Arcangelo and Paul Drews. So they have done some numerical works in this direction using some Monte Carlo simulations to compute uh, these uh, uh, expectation values. And on the analytical side, we have works from Masoud Kalkali, Shahda Safar, Ahmed Hessam, Nathan Agliaroli, and Carlos Perez Sanchez. And of course, there are some overlap as we saw yesterday in the talk of uh, Ahmed Hessam. So yeah, uh, so I will just show some pictures which I borrowed from John Barrett's and El uh, paper just to sort of give some background. So uh, yeah, so there are some numerical evidence that these uh, random NCGs also exhibit some kind of uh, properties that matrix theories have, random matrix theories have. So for instance, we have the Wigner semicircle law. So the eigenvariable distribution should sort of take the form of a semicircle when the matrix size gets large enough. So that is indeed what happens also in the case of random NCG, as we can see. So here we see that the matrix size, as it grows, it sort of get closer, gets closer and closer to the form of a semicircle. And uh, this is very nice. And also we have uh, phase transitions. So if we look at an action of this form, so a symmetry breaking potential kind of form, then it is known that random matrix models of this kind of percent potentials have uh, exhibit phase transitions. And uh, indeed, it's also the case for random NCGs. So well, there are some numerical evidence, as can be seen in these 
in particular this uh, this one, the type one one zero, the type two zero, type one one, and the type zero theory. It's here. It's in particular uh, clear that something like that happens. Right. So this is just some background, I would say, in random SG. So this brings us to what we have done. So what we were thinking of is to sort of include different morphism symmetries in the game as well. So when one does that, then one runs into a overcounting problem because we want to integrate over this uh, Dirac ensembles modulo some automorphisms. And uh, as far as we know, this has so far been ignored in the literature. So we wanted to try that. And uh, what we do is to use homological methods to take care of the integration. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so the path integral will then be determined by the cohomology of a certain complex. And this is described by the batalin vilkovsky formalism, or BV formalism for short. So yeah, this provides a toy model for quantum gravity because yeah, we are modding out the diffeomorphism symmetries. Right. Uh, so then brings us the question, what, what is a diffeomorphism in this case, a non-commutative diffeomorphism? So an automorphism of a PQ fermion space we take to be a pair, so phi and capital phi here. So phi goes from the algebra, the matrix algebra to itself, so the algebra functions. And then the capital phi goes between the Hilbert space of spinners and itself. So this little phi we take as an automorphism, <clears throat> uh, a star automorphism of this algebra functions. And uh, yeah, a by a standard result, it's uh, isomorphic to the projective unitaries. So this we will interpret as the non-commutative diffeomorphism group. And uh, the capital phi here uh, is built by using this uh, little phi here together with uh, a linear automorphism T. And this T should uh, play nice with the other structures. So in particular, it first needs to be satisfy this condition here. And it should also respect the chirality structure and the real structure. So these, this one then constitutes a group K, which sits inside this automorphism of V. And uh, these are to be interpreted as global transformations of spinners. So we will denote this total group by G. So it's P, or P sorry, the productive unitaries times this K here, which I described. And it's the gauge group of the PQ fermion space. So remember that we fix this fermion space. Right, so now that we have the gauge group, we want to look at the gauge transformations. So we obtain a natural left G action on the PQ fermion space. So acting on the algebra, we just apply the phi, basically. And uh, yeah, uh, acting on the Hilbert space, we just, again, apply the phi and the T. So this is just direct. And this induce, induces a left adjoint action on the space of Dirac operators. So it's just given by uh, adjoining, sorry, I need to minimize, uh, yeah. By, yeah, by this adjoint action here. And uh, the thing is that one can describe this quite explicitly, so this phi here. So it's basically be given by uh, acting with a, a joint action. So 
So if you take, so like I said, you have this isomorphism here, PUN and automorphism A. So it's basically given by uh, acting with conjugation of elements in PUN. So therefore, it's quite easy to see that the infinitesimal gauge transformation should take this form of commutators. So the, <clears throat> oh yeah, just to say it, the Lie algebra is then this SUN plus this uh, K here, which is the Lie algebra of this K. Right. So now that we have this, so as we, so the BV formalism is uh, perturbative and only works infinitesimally. So that's why we sort of look at these infinitesimal gauge transformations. So we, in particular, look at this last row here. So the action on the Dirac operators. So the goal here is to compute this path integral given by this. So here we are, we just want to compute the path integral up to these gauge symmetries then, or this, yeah, these gauge symmetries. So, and uh, so we consider the gauge invariant actions. So like I said before, we're only looking at polynomial actions and also polynomial observables. So what we do is we take formal perturbations. So we perturb around some exact solution of the Euler-Lagrange equations of S. And here, this lambda is then just some formal parameter. And D tilde is, yeah, a fluctuation which we, which is just a Dirac operator. So the <clears throat> infinitesimal gauge transformations on the perturbation then will take this form, following form. So in particular, we have this inhomogeneous piece, which turns out to have some consequences later. And uh, yeah, we also have this induced action and we sort of normalize it with, <clears throat> oh, with by dividing by lambda squared because we want to sort of that the first term should be of order lambda to the power of zero. And this uh, subtraction here is convenient to make sure that the first term is of the action is, sorry, the lowest order term in the action is quadratic. So like I said, what we want to do is to compute this path integral perturbatively around this uh, solution of the only Lagrange equation up to these gauge transformations. So this is the goal. Um, so that's where the BV formalism comes in. Um, <clears throat> so the BV formalism, for those of you who don't know, is a homological method to compute path integrals where the action has gauge symmetries or is where the action is gauge invariant. So the thing is that one can think of, well, why don't we just take the quotient it out directly? Well, this is not always a good idea because uh, the action, the group action might not be free, for instance, as in this case. So this is an example, just an analogy from commutative geometry. So if we take the plane and we have a ZN action, then if we just naively mod out this action, then we obtain this cone here. However, we have a fixed point in the origin, which means that there is some kind of singularity. And the, <clears throat> the thing is that this object here is then no longer a space of the same type as before. So yeah, it's no longer a manifold. Uh, Hans, uh, so I, maybe yeah. I ask a question. Uh, so. Okay, I mean, this, uh, yeah, this method usually is very useful, of course, uh, when when you have this 
you know, infinite dimensional space of gauge fields and you mod out by this uh, gauge group, big gauge group, then you get something really finite dimensional. So the advantage there is that um, you reduce some problematic uh, pass integral to something which is could be finite dimensional space of modular spaces. But uh, now that that's okay. But now in this case, so just to get a rough estimate of what's going on, it would be good to know what's the kind of dimensions we are talking about. So usually, this is space. I mean, in the simplest case is dimension. Hermitian and by n matrices dimension n squared, and what is the what's the rough estimate for the dimension of the reduced space we are working on? Just even <clears throat> like in naive quotient, there must be some nice points that have some dimension. So what's the kind of rough estimate for that dimension? Do we know that? Uh, so the gauge group is well. I guess it depends on this gauge group. So the things that <clears throat> yeah. So in our examples, we will not we will ignore this k, so we'll only have this p u n. So then we only have this Liadra s u n. So yeah, like like I said, this is we can only the BV formulas can only take care of infinitesimal things. So what we're looking at is we mod out sort of these infinitesimal gauge transformations, sort of infinitesimal gauge transformations. Yes. Yes. So yes. So the dimension of s u n is. Uh, so these are traceless anti-hermitian matrices. Uh, N squared minus one, maybe? Something like that. Yeah, let's say. So then if we mod out this, what happens? So you should somehow, yeah. So does what something is, remains does it, after one? So this is something like, one, yeah. It looks like yeah. the quotient is almost like one one dimensional or something, right? Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, I actually haven't really thought of that. So, but it should probably not be very hard to sort of find something. No, no, of, I mean, that's uh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, just yeah. the difference of dimension. Thank you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, so what? So, like I said, the BV formalism is a homological method to compute path integrals. But so, what does it? Well, what it does is that it assigns a DG algebra to every gauge invariant action S. So, it can be sort of split in roughly in two parts: one classical BV formalism and a part which is BV quantization. So we will basically, or more or less, follow the modern formulation by Costello and William. So yeah, this can be found in either William's thesis or the books written by them. And uh, the way we will compute this path integral is using homological perturbation theory, which I will mention a bit more about later in the talk. So, okay, so first, what is the classical BV formalism? Well, it takes us input data, the following. So first of all, of course, the our Dirac ensemble. So the vector space of perturbations. So this recall that this denotes is an exact solution of uh, the Euler-Lagrange equations. And so we look at the perturbations around this denote. And then we look at also, we also put in the infinitesimal gauge symmetries. So in this case, it's this SUN plus this K here, which acts on the space of Dirac operators. And also we put in a G invariant action, which will sort of determine the perturbative dynamics. Oops, 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 oops. Uh, what happened? Ah, yeah, sorry. So with this input data, we get some output. So what we get are the classical observables, <clears throat> which is symmetric, the symmetric algebra of some complex, sorry, we have some L, where this L should be interpreted as the sort of the collection of 
fields, antifields, ghosts, and antifields for ghosts. And then we also have this differential on this uh, classical observables. So this differential for those of you who, for those of you who know this, is the BV differential. And this is determined by the Euler-Lagrange equations and the infinitesimal gauge transformations. I will not write it out explicitly here. And the thing, the crucial thing is that to get, together with these classical observables, we can, there is a canonical shifted Poisson structure. So explicitly it can be constructed like this. So if we take dual pair basis of this L here, so we take some EAs in the, these, so these are the fields, the, the linear observables for fields, and then we have for the antifields corresponding to these fields, and then we have thetas for the ghosts and TIs for the anti-ghosts. So this consider dual power basis, so these are dual to each other, and these two are dual to each other. So from this, we can construct the canonical minus one shifted symplectic structure using the Durham differential, as usual. And yeah, uh, as one does in commutative geometry, one can get a, um, <clears throat> a Poisson bracket from the symplectic structure here by using the Hamiltonian vector fields. So a Hamiltonian vector field is defined by this equation here. Just so applying the Durham differential to the Hamiltonian vector fields corresponding to A should be the same as contracting it with the Hamiltonian vector field with the, the shifted symplectic structure. So the shifted Poisson bracket or anti-bracket as it is called is simply given by, yeah, contracting with this Hamiltonian vector fields. And this anti-bracket indeed satisfies some graded anti-symmetry, graded Jacobian identity, and the derivation, derivation property together with some compatibility conditions with the, which is nice. So now we have <clears throat> done the classical BV formalism part. So from the input data, we have obtained a complex together with this shifted Poisson bracket. So the next step is to look at the quantum BV formalism because yeah, quantization is the same as computing these path integrals. So yeah, we want to look at the quantum part. So what one does there is that one uses the anti-bracket to deform the differential to quantize it. And what one does is that one defines the BV Laplacian, which is simply given by this pairwise contraction of uh, these phi i's in elements in the uh, symmetric algebra L of L, which are the classical observables. And uh, yeah, this ha these checks here are just means that we omit them. So uh, I have to stop doing that. Uh, right. And uh, what one obtains is that one get, so what one obtains is a complex of quantum observables with the, the same symmetric algebra here, but now with a deformed differential. So the next step is then to compute the path integral. So like I said before, this path integral should be determined by the cohomology of this complex here, the quantum observables. And uh, we want to compute it perturbatively in lambda using homological perturbation theory. So what one does then is to split the quantum differential in the following way. So a free part, an interacting part, which depends on lambda and uh, this uh, h bar part. So the starting point is then that one starts with a free observables. So we sort of ignore the lambda d in part and the BV Laplacian part. 
And Sorry, then, Hans, uh, before uh, maybe. Oh, yeah, sure. I just yeah, ask one more question. Yeah, so the complex, is it Z graded or, uh, or Z2 graded? I suppose it's Z2 graded, right? Uh, your, your complex. The, the, this one, I mean. Or yeah, yeah, I mean, what is the, yeah, I mean, it's uh, is that graded, I would say. Yeah, because uh, it's not n graded. I mean, you don't go beyond dimension two or one or you know, beyond dimension two, maybe even. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's uh, again because that you you need a grading for a complex. I was wondering what is the grading. Ah, uh, yeah. So, all right. So, each of these comes with a degree. So. This is a degree zero, this is a degree minus one, minus two, and degree one. I see. Uh -huh. And then we take the symmetric algebra. So this degree sort of, yeah, you get some induced degree on the symmetric algebra. Yeah, so it's like so a it's, mixed, it's that mixed degree, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, so yeah, you use degree of these elements, uh, of these parts to sort of get a degree on yeah. SML. So, yeah uh, was that okay or yeah no i think yeah i, th I think this is some sort of lie algebra cohomology but it's a, in a kind of yeah. sophisticated more sophisticated way yeah yeah exactly yeah all right yeah okay very good thank you yeah thanks right uh, how am i on time all right yeah okay. good so uh, <clears throat> now we have sort of the free observables, so observables without interaction. So the next part is to choose a strong deformation retract. So this choice of strong deformation retract can be thought of as some kind of a gauge fixing procedure. So <clears throat> this is what one uses to, in, to get, sorry. So we choose this strong deformation retract. So we, in particular, <clears throat> have this cohomology here. And uh, then we take the sum of everything to sort of get this free observables here and the symmetric algebra of the cohomology here. And then we have a theorem, which is the homological perturbation lemma, which says that, okay, we can <clears throat> deform this differential D3 and uh, we can obtain another uh, deformation retract, strong deformation retract of this strong deformation retract up over here in this following form. So in particular, we're interested in this map. So <clears throat> yeah, if you didn't really follow this part, it's okay because the important part is this map pi here, which there is of which there is an explicit formula, which I will show in the next slide. So this pi is some kind of a projection and this is what, so it should sort of project down to cohomology somehow. And uh, yeah, this is what gives us our endpoint correlation functions. So if we take observables phi one to phi n here and want to compute their expectation value, we just apply the map pi tilde. And this pi tilde is built up of some, pi, this pi is some projection you should think of. And this delta here is the perturbation part of the differential. So the lambda d int plus the h bar <laughs> times the BV Laplacian. And then h here is a contracting homotopy, which comes with a strong deformation retract. So this is applied, as you can see, layer by layer. So yeah, order by order, I should say, in lambda and h bar. So this computes for us this path integral. And quite naturally, one can sort of get Feynman diagrams from, from this formula here, which uh, we will see a bit of later. Right, so now we have the framework. So one of the goals for us was to see if these gauge symmetries actually contributes to these correlation functions in this world of random non-commutative geometry. 
So we are investigating two cases. One, where which the solution we perturb around d0 is zero. And then we look at the case where when it's non-zero, so a non-trivial vacuum. So in the case, we start with the case where uh, this d0 is zero. So in this case, we'll consider the following type of actions where, so this <clears throat> action is the trace of the Dirac operator squared plus some interacting part, which is a sum of monomials of degree greater than or equal to three. So then in this case, like I said, these outer parts here depend on the, of the differential depend on the gauge symmetries. So, and in this case, it's just zero because the, the zero sort of solution is invariant under the whole gauge Lie algebra action. So the cohomology is simply given by these end, end parts of the L complex. Right, so let us introduce some graphical calculus. So we will denote the, okay, so the anti, the anti field for ghosts by dotted, by dots and by the anti fields for the fields, we'll denote by these wiggly lines and straight lines for the fields themselves and dash dashes for the ghosts. So then if we just take a particular example of a interaction, interaction, so we take a quartic interaction, then we can compute the two point correlation function to be something like this. So this is sort of what one expects, but however, note that we have no contribution from lines in the gauge part. So in fact, one can, we can actually, we actually show that in this case, when we perturb around d zero equals zero, and if we compute sort of the sort of the observables for sort of the expectation values for observables, receive no contribution at all from these dotted and dashed lines. So in other words, we have no contributions from the gauge symmetry in the d zero equals zero case. But then one was asked the questions: What happens if we take the non-zero case in the quartic 0.1 model. So yeah, we chose to work only with this quartic 0.1 model because it's uh, yeah the easiest one and it already gives us some insight in what happens. So recall that the 0.1 geometry had Dirac operators of the following form, minus i times commutators of L, where L is the trace-free Hermitian n times n, sorry, I should say anti-Hermitian uh, n times n matrix. And uh, this time, because we're perturbing around something which is not zero, we actually get contributions from the gauge parts. So these are no longer zero, which means that the cohomology is non-trivial. And these G zeros, are Lie subalgebras stabilizing the D0. So in particular, they are subalgebras, so they are <clears throat> not the entire Lie algebra, which means that the symmetry has broken. So again, we have this graphical calculus here in a similar fashion, just that now we are a bit careful because the cohomology has broken up in two parts. So yeah, we need to sort of consider it in the ghost and antifield for ghost parts. And uh, yeah, indeed, what we get when we compute the two-point function is that, okay, so we have the blue parts here. These are sort of the pieces we had before. And uh, the red parts here are contributions uh, to the ghost from the ghost parts. So indeed, we have contributions from the gauge symmetry. And uh, yeah, this is analogous to the Higgs mechanism. So in the equal zero case, we perturb 
here up in the top and everything looks very symmetric. However, if you go down here into the well, which is the non zero non-zero case, then suddenly the symmetry is broken and we get this Higgs mechanism as probably many of us have seen. Right, so this brings us to the end of the talk. So let me just quickly summarize what we have done. So yeah, we worked with fuzzy spectral triples. So these are spectral triples where the algebra functions are taken to be n times n matrices, the Hilbert space to be the matrices times some uh, Clifford module, which is c to the power k. And as we know, the Dirac operator encodes the geometry. And the thing with these fast spectral triples is that the Dirac operators are fully classified and there's an explicit formula for them, which is perfect for doing random non-commutative geometry on. So <clears throat> there are numerical evidence of certain properties from random matrix theory, which also can be seen in random one can do geometry, for instance, phase transitions, which sort of motivates the study of this random NCG. However, one of the things which was not taken care of yet was gauge symmetries. So this is where we attempted some work to do some work on. And uh, yeah, what it means is that we want to take care of some kind of overcounting problem where we want to compute this path integral up to these gauge symmetries. So we want to integrate over the space of Dirac operators up to some gauge symmetries. And the way we do it is to use homological methods. <clears throat> and uh, the name is BV, the BV formalism and the homological perturbation. So these are the formalism we use to compute this path integral or expectation values or correlation functions or what we want to call them. So these endpoint correlation functions so we want to see if this, if they sort of receive any contributions from the gauge symmetry. And in the case when the when we perturb around the zero Dirac operator, we don't see anything. However, as soon as we go outside of it, then we see that we get some contribution from the gauge symmetry. And it's essentially because of symmetry breaking. So yeah, thank you all for your attention. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot, Hans, for the nice presentation and uh, also for the well, that you helped us with our schedule. Yeah. Are there any questions? Hi, Hans. Yeah, thank you again for accepting to talk at <laughs> this <laughs> before your yeah. actual time. So it was great help. Yeah. yeah no problem. So yeah, indeed. Uh, so since the original integral is uh, actually, as you know, of course, uh, convergent and uh, in some cases uh, can be computed. So it would be nice to compare to two methods. I mean, the, the one that you get by reduction and the one before reduction. So yes, I agree. That would be nice to so see. It would be nice to, to compare. I mean, that's, um, yeah. And of course, I should say, I mean, this was very pleasant to see for me because when I was doing cyclic homology, I mean, I used a lot of homological perturbation theory in that context. So oh, nice. You, you, you use, uh, you know, these things to, to reduce big complexes to small complexes. Yeah. So this is very standard. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a very nice yeah. talk. Yeah. Thank you. So we have seen a lot of talks that uh, you can have this Hermitian one matrix models coming from this spectral triples. What, I mean, your gauge transformation, how does it look on uh, Hermitian one matrix models? Do you have a picture of what that means there? Uh, sorry, the Hermitian. I mean, you matrix. have a Hermitian one matrix models with double trace interaction, these models where Nathan are working on. All right, yes. And your gauge transformation, the gauge group, what is it on this Hermitian matrices in this Hermitian one matrix model? Do you have a picture of that? Um, well, not really. So the thing is that uh, we were 
attempting to do something, but it was quite hard to sort of find a solution for, I mean, the old Lagrange equations, or I mean, maybe we didn't try hard enough, but uh, yeah, I don't really have anything here, I'm afraid. Or maybe I'm misunderstanding the question. Uh, yeah, I mean, you said you divide by this gauge group and you get a one dimensional space probably at the end, I don't know, from your n squared dimensional space. And if you go to a Hermitian one matrix model, it's also n dimensional integral yeah. which you have to take into account. And what does the group there on this Hermitian matrices? This is my question. Do you have an interpretation of this gauge group there? I mean, <clears throat> okay, so the, okay, so, Wait, just give me a second, that'd be fine. Yeah, so the gauge group will always be this PUN times this K here, when this K only depends on the spinorial part. So was that was that what you were asking or? Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that's the answer, right? I mean, yeah. okay. Um, do we get something? Uh, comparable to Lille with quantum gravity, where you can apply your uh, approach? Oh, uh, I'm not very knowledgeable in <laughs> Lille with quantum gravity, unfortunately. So, but I mean, as soon as you have some kind of gauge symmetry showing up, this is one way of doing things, I would say. Okay, more questions? Mm, hi, uh, can you hear me? Peter? Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Hi, Hans. Uh, nice talk. Uh, yes. uh, we have. Uh, I mean, uh, unfortunately, we have a difference in this institute. So I didn't hear the beginning. Do you? Oh. Do you have those two ghosts? Uh, for, uh, or you stop at only, only one ghost? Uh, uh, sorry. I could you repeat the question? Okay. You have ghost fields, uh, I guess. And yes. Do you have to put uh, ghost to ghost uh, fields and and um, form? You can stop at the first level. Or... Uh, in this case, we can stop at the first level because we don't look at gauge transformations of gauge transformations. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, you have some closure. But in, in principle, one could go higher. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, more questions maybe from Zoom audience, someone? Okay, does not seem to be the case. Then uh, so thanks a lot, Hans, again yeah, for thanks. presentation and helping us. And we uh, we have uh, yeah half an hour break, and we will tell you then how we continue with the schedule. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>